All right, hello and welcome to another episode here of the Warf's Rebellion podcast for Age Soul War. I'm the host Niels Eichhorn, and this is the last time I'm doing one from Austria. Next time it will be in Germany, and I'm joined by my partner in crime again, Andrew Hauk, who is responsible for this time's episode. It was his idea to kind of look into like books that have been published. 20 or 30 years ago and kind of look and talk to the author and kind of have a conversation about what they think now about their books and scholarship and changes in that. So um, any criticisms can be directed at Andrew for, for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, he is still in Portier and not changing in that regard but he's looking forward to also not have the Tour de France in the city this year. If you're watching, we're in the middle of that. Our guest, that's the important part, is Anne Sarah Rubin from Baltimore. And yes, that is the Baltimore with that infamous bridge and a very famous War of 1812, actually more mm -hmm. a minor engagement of the War of 1812 and some something important for U.S. history, but not for us, obviously, important here. Um, Anne got her Ph.D. at the University of Virginia, and since 2000 is a professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She is the author of quite a few books. Um, obviously, for my newest project, I'm very much interested in her through the heart of Dixie, Sherman's March, and American Memory. But we are going to talk about the other one in 2005, A Shattered Nation, The Rise and Fall of the Confederacy. So, Anne, thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, this was Andrew's idea. He's the geek in this, in this case, and I let him start today. Okay, thanks for having me. <laughs> Well, it, it really is uh, exciting to talk to you. Um, so we were, we were with Niels. Uh, we had talked about um, maybe doing a retrospective of some important scholarship. And I, I was reading uh, your book. I mean, I'd used it, like I said, I'd used it a, a few times for specific uh, purposes, but I hadn't read it cover to cover. And I really enjoyed it. And I realized that it was sounding... It sounded contemporary. It sounded like it was written. Mm -hmm. It could be written today, um, and so that was our kind of jumping-off point. And I thought, why not contact you and see if you'd like to talk about it? Um, so, how do you feel um, about your book twenty years on? I mean, well, almost twenty years on because it's <laughs> nineteen, I think, right? Yeah, nineteen. Um, I mean, first of all, I'm gratified that people are still reading it and that it's still really like part of the conversation about. Confederate nationalism. Um, I feel good about it. You know, it was, um, I was just saying before we started that I actually started the book uh, really in 1994 as my dissertation. Um, and in the, I do remember as I was finishing the manuscript for the book and turning it in and feeling like, well, I couldn't make it any better without sort of a time machine and going back and making different decisions when I was starting my dissertation. Mm. Um, so it does, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it holds up. I do think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm always, ha everyone's always happy to know someone's reading their books still. So mm. I would, I would say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> the reason I ask that is because, um, you know, a lot of the books that, um, that I've, that I've, Right. I mean, like like we were talking before before we started recording, um, I've gotten myself back up to speed pretty well on on scholarship over the last you know, decade or so. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that's dated, really dated. Um, even things that have been written since your book was published, there are books that are that are that are dated. Um, and I don't feel that with yours. Um, even the way the way that it that it's written um, in terms of style. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I did perspective, um, have managed to withstand the, the test of time. Whereas I think Niels, you and I were talking about um, 
books like, um, well, what did we say? We talked about David Blight. Yeah, we talked about David Blight, especially like the recent reunion, right? It's sort of like yeah. when we think of I mean, memory. It, it, it's a great book. It's a great book, but it is a product of its time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think when you read Race and Reunion, you have to think of it as the sort of as foundational, right? So mm -hmm. that that it's it sort of set the the terms of the debate and then the debate has moved past mm -hmm. it. I think in terms of of my book, I made a couple of of decisions or I was I was interested in a couple of questions and and that I do think made it more lasting. The first one was I was really frustrated with the debate in the 1980s over sort of was Confederate nationalism, quote unquote, real. I was mm. like, this is, this is a not that to me was an unproductive mm -hmm. debate right. because it, it was real to the people who believed in it essentially mm -hmm. was. So I, I wanted to sort of sidestep that debate entirely and take nationalism and take uh, Confederate expressions of nationalism mm. on their own terms. So I think that's one way that that I think was helpful was that I wasn't, I tried to be less reactive yeah. to other mm. scholars. Mm. I think um, the fact that I wanted it to be an all Confederacy book, because there had also been a bunch of books in the 80s that were like, you know, Confederate nationalism in three counties or Confederate nationalism even just in one state. And I felt like you can't be making a national argument mm -hmm. from a limited perspective. Um, so I was very um, conscious of wanting to do all 11 states of the Confederacy. And of course, you know, the vagaries of where I did my research and where resources were, all 11 states are not evenly represented, but at least they're in there. In, in some ways, and, and this sense of, of this nationalism as a national phenomenon, mm -hmm. rather than as a phenomenon concentrated just in like Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I did was I knew that I wanted it to, that, that most books prior to this about nationalism had sort of had a hard stop in April and May of 1865. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I knew that that was not what I wanted to do, that I wanted to stretch the book um, into the beginnings of Reconstruction, at least, mm -hmm. into, I sort of, uh, I think the reason I picked 1868 was that was when the um, Southern Historical Society was founded. And so mm -hmm. it was like, here's this moment before the lost cause, right? Okay. But the, you know, if you think of the lost cause as being really mm -hmm. born out of the Southern Historical Society and all of their writings and and all of that. Um, this was this moment before the lost cause had kind of completely coalesced. And I I did realize in the course of of writing the dissertation, writing the book, that actually the second half of the book, the reconstruction, the post-war half, is I think actually the better half of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Like the first half is is fine, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's it's good, but it's the second half that's really, I think, where I made the mark. Yeah. yeah, and I say we both would agree with that because that's really right where where he said like earlier, like the, this this nonsensical debate, right? It's like is the Confederacy in a nation or is it what is it? And it's like it's a waste of time. Yeah, they, yeah, it's exactly it's a waste of time. They believe they are an, an independent nation and they have sort of their own identity. And we'll talk about identity a little bit and in, in, mm -hmm. in later on today. But it's like both Andrew and I when we talked like a week ago of like, what, what do we want to ask? What kind of topics do we think most important? It was almost all reconstruction and post-war because that's really is a key, right? And you kind of so nicely has put it in a few points, places in the book that it's like the, the state is dead, but the nation continues. Mm -hmm. And now like there, there's this beautiful passage where you're kind of talking about like, yes, they're now American again, but they're not American at heart. Mm -hmm. they're, they're they're remaining in this confederate identity and that mm -hmm. that really strikes good because it's like that's that's a challenge here right like you're you're having this nation that still ends in the united states but is somewhat separate from the united states 
which I think is really the crux of your of your book. I mean, oh, yeah. it, it's that 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 um, nugget of I don't know what uh, that yeah. germinated grain of, of 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 nationalism that builds and builds and even at the end it's still it's still there and mm -hmm. and I think too part of it is um I think one of the the aspects that that was really important to me is this idea also that people have multiple identities at once right mm -hmm. can't just be and so people are sometimes um you know, one identity takes pre precedence over another identity. I'm I'm a Confederate. I feel loyal to the Confederacy, but at the same time, you know, I am worried that my wife and children at home are starving. So I'm going to, not necessarily desert, but kind of more like go AWOL, right, and come home to help them for a while, and then yeah. often go back, right. And it, so is that yeah. an expression of of no longer feeling a nationalist sentiment? I, I would argue, no, they do still feel this commitment to the Confederacy. It's just that, that their familial identity takes precedence for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was also yeah. something that I was trying to get at, which is that that people are complicated and people yeah. make complicated decisions, you know, that you're not all one thing or all another thing. You're both or you're multitudes. Well, and then talking about reconstruction and even even wartime reconstruction as mm -hmm. as the federal army uh, recaptured and occupied territory, um, and it was a question of uh, taking or not uh, oaths of, of of loyalty. Right. Um, so, do they take them? Do they not take them? Um, if they if they decide not to, is that dangerous for their families? So, that, are they morally coerced into taking them? uh if they take one if they take if they if they take a, a loyalty oath does that mean that they're renouncing their confederate identity and assuming a union identity again um right and and i think in general people saw the oath in very instrumental terms mm -hmm. that you take the oath because taking the oath gets you back the rights that you think you are entitled to but you can still feel this you know, I think I call it an, an emotional identity or a sentimental identity, right? It doesn't, it doesn't make you feel, taking the oath doesn't automatically make you feel a sense of loyalty to the United mm. States. Yeah. It's sort of pragmatic, right? Of like, It's very what, pragmatic. Yes. Right, that's what, what do I need? <laughs> what do I need to do right. to be part of the political body again? Right. right. Body politics. Yeah. Cynical. Yeah, yeah, we can call it cynical too. <laughs> yeah, it's all of those things, but it is, it's pragmatic. Yeah. And I mean, look, you can't, you know, I think it's hard to imagine a situation where any, I mean, asking someone to take a loyalty oath, I think is probably inherently, it's inherently coercive. Yeah. 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 Right? Because you can't, you know, you can't coerce loyalty. You can't. No. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, for the moment you can, right? Like if you point a gun at my head, of course I'm loyal to you for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or two days, and then I'll try to run away. <laughs> right. Or, or in terms of, you know, I know I, you know, at some of these state universities, I think in Florida and in Texas, they're talking about wanting faculty to take these kinds of loyalty oaths, or you can't say anything against the state government. And it's mm -hmm. like, I, I mean, I'm the child of a, a First Amendment lawyer, so my my civil libertarian tendencies are pretty are pretty tough. But I mean, what is that? You know, right, like yeah. you can't. How is that real? Yeah, well, <laughs> that takes us into like a lot of modern problems, mm -hmm. <laughs> right there. Right? But that's like, just it, right? Yeah. Is that that these issues mm -hmm. all have you know a modern yeah. echo? least yeah yeah well, well and there, there are parts in here that reminded me of um contemporary politics as well well um, yeah that was sort of one of the things that we were kind of curious about too right of like where you you end the books in 68 was sort of like the birth of the lost cause but really yeah. the lost cause is sort of a continuation of that confederate nationalism so like where do you see like differences or do you do you see like when when you look at 
lost causers today, neo confederates today. Do you do you see some of that like confederate nation identity still there, or how how do you think it has changed over the years? I yeah, those are great questions. So the lost cause today or the, the Confederate, so-called Confederate nationalists today, I think bear almost no, have almost no connection to uh, to the, the Confederacy of um, the 1860s. I mean, I think that that so much of you know the the today's neo confederatism is is less neo confederatism and more a sort of harkening back to this imagined pre civil rights utopia, right? You know, we know that um, the the Confederate flag on on state flags and things like that that comes really is a post World War II anti civil rights phenomenon. And so now this this turning of the Confederate flag into this kind of generic emblem of of rebellion and and uh, uh, you know defiance is is very much no matter how many people say it's heritage not hate it's mm. really like did your personal ancestor fight under the Army of Northern Virginia battle flag I don't think in most cases I would, I would argue no. And I, you know, my in-laws um, lived in Maine and on the road to their house in Maine was a barn painted with a giant Confederate battle flag. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're, in, you're in Booth Bay, Maine. You are not a Confederate. Like this is not real. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I find that frustrating, right? This, this, mm -hmm. and also a denial, right? When people say, oh, I'm just honoring my ancestors or my ancestors didn't um, fight for slavery. I'm like, mm, but they did, but right? They did. Even, yeah, if you're yeah. a, even if you were not a, a, your ancestor was not himself a slaveholder, he, he was white and he was fighting, on some level to preserve a system that elevated him because of his very whiteness. And he was in all likelihood aspired to enter the slaveholding class. So mm -hmm. it's a, right. you can't elide that. I think it, it's. That's it's, it's so funny that you bring that up because you just brought back a memory of like, oh God, it's about two weeks ago we were walking in, in town and I, I still kick myself that I didn't have my phone out to take a picture. But there was this this red Peugeot driving by. And on the back was like a, a sticker of a Arizona license plate. And below it, a rectangular Confederate flag. <laughs> and, and I saw that and I was like, what the... And we, my wife saw it and we were both like, what's just happened? And I kind of was like, well, it's this... In Europe, you see it a lot of with like biker communities and sort of this freedom, independence kind of thing. And they don't understand like the connotations that this flag has. And it's it's just so frustrating in that I would, moment. I would say this too, which is is the position that I I really had and and still have is right, if I take the Confederacy seriously as a nation then there's no reason to be, I mean, it, flying the Confederate flag over, you know, a state house, right? Because it's the flag of another nation, right? So like, yeah. you don't see people in the United States flying, you know, you don't see yeah. the state house in the United States flying the, you know, the Union Jack or yeah. something like that, right? So that's, that was my other issue, which is, right, you can't fly the flag of another nation in a national environment, um, obviously, what people want to do on their private property is their business. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. You do whatever you want. But you can't have the state sanction of it. Mm -hmm. And it is so interesting. I mean, I wrote this book over, you know, in the early 2000s when it, it, it seemed like the flags and the monuments and all that would sort of stand. It just didn't seem to occur to anybody that they could just come down. Right. And and so to to look back first from the vantage point of um, 
2016 when when Nikki Haley brought the Confederate flag down finally in South Carolina and and that moment and then of course um 2020 when the monument people realized they could literally just pull the monuments down um is really striking to me just throw some rope on it and pull it down <laughs> right like oh <laughs> who thought that you know it's yeah. it's it's a fascinating change to me well, um, where, uh, where are you from originally? And, and, and are you, you're from Virginia? Is that? No. <laughs> I'm originally from New York. From New York. Um, okay. So I grew up in the, the suburbs of New York city. Um, my parents both grew up in Brooklyn. My, so I'm the, the, I can't count the generation exactly. My great grandparents came from Eastern Europe. Okay. So I always tell everybody, like, I don't have a dog in this fight. I had no ancestors here um, before the Civil War, during the Civil War. You know, my earliest ancestors came um, I, in the 1880s. Uh, most of them came around 1900. Okay. So yeah. it's, a, it's well, definitely a, a different um, kind of perspective, right? That, that I did not, where I grew up was uh, kind of revolutionary war country. Right. I grew up um, right near White Plains, New York. So the Battle of White Plains and like, you know, the place that Washington spent the night in and, and stuff like that. Not really the Civil War at all. Well, the reason the reason I ask, and, and this is um, I think, Niels, when you went to the States uh, at the beginning, you you landed immediately in the South. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And so you you had an image of the Civil War um, going to the States you, and you landed in the South. Yeah. Um, like and i'm from the north um yeah. and from you know the west central indiana is uh kind of um uh, war of 1812 tippecanoe that mm -hmm. that area so there's a lot more early 1900s um early republic uh history um new france with vincennes george rogers clark that type of thing I was interested in the Civil War, but um, I had no idea how much uh, the lost cause actually uh, uh, actually covered the the landscape across mm -hmm. the South until what you're saying, uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, when you started to see all these maps and the number of the monuments, and then you started to you know. The, it's an incredible amount of of, of 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 physical vestiges to this this memory, and how, yeah, how incredible it was. And it was for me. It, it wasn't even a question. The 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 monuments. Okay, I, I'd seen them. I'd been to I'd been to I'd been to Richmond. I'd seen Monument Avenue, um, but I didn't realize that they were in so many towns. I mean, more than a thousand. Come it's on. like every small town, every yeah. every, you every, know, county every, seat. County seat. <laughs> every county seat, every county seat. Yeah, they got the Confederate with this with the with the, yeah. st the, stand, the standing soldier. I mean, yeah, almost all too. made by a by a company, <laughs> I think, in New Jersey, actually. Yeah, well, some of the Boston was there one in Boston too. Maybe, maybe. And some of the early ones, I remember the one in Macon. I think was I think Tom Brown has it in his book. Is he like actually. No, no, no. It's actually like, I think it was like an Italian statue that they kind of had in a catalog and they were like, oh, this one looks nice. Buy that one. I'll believe it. But I, I will say too, I mean, I didn't realize the degree to which there were monuments really um, in the North either. And, you know, I mean, I grew up, like I said, right. I grew up right outside of New York City. My parents worked in New York City. I went into New York City all the time. Um, and the I didn't realize that the statue um, on Fifth Avenue outside of the Plaza Hotel and, and FAO Schwartz, where I used to go, the toy store that I would go to as a kid, I didn't realize that statue was Sherman until I started working on my Sherman book. I had no wow. idea. You know, and I, you know, I had grown up hearing about Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn, but right. again, that didn't register to me as a civil war. Yeah. You know, it, it didn't, it, it's, it's the landscape is sort of invisible until you actually look well, at it. Uh, if mm -hmm. you went to Indianapolis, I don't know if you've been to Indianapolis before. I have not. But, um, the the whole the very center of the city, um, Monument Circle, 
-hmm. is the the tallest of the of the uh the tallest of the of the of the war monuments the gr monuments um the soldiers and sailors monument it's it's enormous in the, uh, the circle downtown indianapolis and it was just uh it was the landmark in, in indianapolis and it wasn't until maybe 20 years ago that I realized it's a civil war monument. It's, right. you know, and walking around the base of it, you get the, the story of the civil war, you get the, well, a, a memory, uh, um, mm. a story of the civil war, a narrative of the civil war. Mm. Um, and it is the central monument, the central point uh, of the city. I mean, all, all the, all roads lead to the, to the civil war monument. Yeah. Yeah, even DC, which I, you know, I've lit, I had lived in this, in DC forever. You know, I've been in this area since uh, I actually, before I started at UMBC, I taught at American University for two years. So I've lived in the DC area since 1999. And, um, you know, all the circles, right? Scott Circle, Logan Circle, they're, yeah, they're all they're generous, all yeah. War. Yeah. But again, I, you don't, you don't sort of click into it until, until you know. Yeah. And they're all just sort of there. I always found that's the biggest, the most fun part to teach students, right? Of like that moment where you're like, mm -hmm. let's just look at all of our surroundings. Our history is everywhere, right? Like, like right. So war names, Spanish names and French names, English mm -hmm. names and all these like, and, and and that's the moment where it's like the history really comes alive because you're, you're walking on historic names. Right. Yeah. Exactly. The land, it's everywhere. Right. And so yeah. then with it where being near baltimore teaching near baltimore of course realizing yeah. that there are all these confederate monuments in baltimore a city there that was. Yeah. was a union Oof. city and baltimore. so how did that happen and how did how did we get there and so that's always yeah. something that's been really great to to sort of unpack with my students my, uh... and it's interesting too i always ask i teach civil war and then i teach <clears throat> um a couple of Southern history classes. And I always start those classes by asking, I say, all right, everyone who thinks they're a, they're a Northerner, raise their hand. A few of them do. Everyone who thinks they're a Southerner, raise their hand. And again, a few of them do, and I'll often sort of pick them out and I'll, I'll say it like, where are you from? Like, where are you from? And, you know, a lot of times they'll be like, oh, you know, I grew up in South Carolina or my grandparents are in South Carolina or whatever. But the vast majority of them, because the vast majority of our students are from Maryland, the vast majority of them have this sort of nebulous Maryland. They're sort of like, we're neither, you know, this kind of nebulous Maryland identity or mid Atlantic identity, which so, is not nearly as, as powerful. You, you being from, from New York, mm -hmm. we're, for you, Maryland is what? Is it? Ooh, North that's a South? good question. It... Yeah, I mean, for me, Maryland is, it is the middle ground, right? Which is that it had slavery and it was deeply invested in slavery. And I've done a lot of research on slavery in Maryland um, and it, particularly in Baltimore. So in that regard, it is it is deeply Southern to me. But also I recognize that, you know, Maryland, I was just in in. Uh, Mississippi last week and and you know Maryland and Mississippi are very different right but but I look at Mar I mean Maryland was segregated right one of the road to brown cases is a Maryland case so to me Maryland seemed pretty southern I mean it's south of the Mason-Dixon line right so but I would make a distinction between Maryland and the you know the deep south yeah. for sure um, and even, you know, going to grad school in Virginia, you know, Charlottesville versus, you know, Arlington, right, are two, there's a, there's a difference there yeah. versus say like, you know, Danville or Southside Virginia or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a continuum. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah, for me, Maryland was always, South of Maryland was the South, um, mm -hmm. but the Maryland itself was kind of and it really uh uh i think what what um struck what drove it home for me was frederick Douglass. yeah okay so he was a slave in maryland yep he, and he emancipated himself mm -hmm. okay so he's from maryland okay so maryland was the south and harriet tubman <laughs> also yeah yeah. Which I, mean, yeah. I don't think it's a coincidence that the two most famous, you know, escapees or, or self-emancipators 
are from a border state, yeah. right? It's, you don't have to go that far. Um, yeah. To yeah. reach freedom. Yeah. Hop on a train and you're in, in an hour in Philadelphia. Right. right. And, a train, a boat. You can even just get across the border. Yeah. You, know, you can walk to freedom. So the, yeah, it gives was, Maryland an interesting identity, I think. Yeah. While, while you guys were talking, one thing though that came to mind, because like when you teach Southern history or do Southern history, there's always this like, oh, there is not really a South. There's many Souths, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's mm -hmm. all these different, like you can't compare North Georgia and Southern Georgia, or you can't really North Mississippi and the Black Belt Mississippi or like, like all these different, you get, we get the point, right? But how like this is sort of the challenge right so we have this broad spectrum these many different cells but how do we mold that into one nation in the 1860s or now yeah. or... no let's go let's go with the 1860s <laughs> i mean That's i think it's back to the book <laughs> we wanted to talk about yeah, bring it back to the book <laughs> because right you do have um you know, slavery, obviously that's not perfect, right? You have four slave states that stay in the union, um, but it's certainly the depth of, of investment in slavery, the degree to which their economies revolve around slavery. And I think, you know, obviously Maryland and Kentucky are both quite divided and, and uh, you know, the, the old Avery Craven joke about Kentucky waiting till after the Civil War to secede, I think also really applies to Maryland. Um, yeah, it's pretty good, um, right? That, that these are states uh, that that in many ways become more Southern, Southern mm -hmm. after the Civil War with segregation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's the big, you know, I think that's the big unifying factor I think it's, uh, that's, I mean, you know, that's how I always have defined it is south of the Mason-Dixon line, south of the Ohio. Mm. So you'd say slavery is sort of the, like if, if we kind of think of it like in, in the sort of imagining of a community of, of a nation, right? So slavery is the key for you. Yeah, because I think anything else, right? If you say, oh, states' rights, is is this principle that unites the confederacy it's like right and what's the why did they want states rights to what <laughs> right yeah. states rights to do what what's the big issue yeah. that they're fighting with um other states about and slavery or you know somebody once at a cocktail party was like it was really all about the tariff yeah right <laughs> Uh, I, I, I can tell him, that it was the aquarium where was, I got told it that. It was before Dave Hacker's <laughs> article because I said I don't think 620,000 people died over the tariff when now it would have to be 750,000 people died over the tariff. But right, it's not the tariff. The tariff is about slavery and, and protecting that institution yeah. of slavery. And I think the the unwillingness, the, the perpetual unwillingness of people to reckon Mm -hmm. the damaging impacts of slavery and Jim Crow is the problem. And also the fact that people can't seem to separate that just because your ancestors were involved, you don't have to defend your ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. Arguing that, that the United States in 1860 was a slaveholding nation and was a nation in, in many ways defined by chattel slavery is not an indictment of who you are today, right? right? It's not, it's, mm. but you have to accept what the past was. You can't sugarcoat it because you can sugarcoat it all you want. It's still there. Well, I mean, it, and talking about, we were talking about um, freedom of speech and it reminds mm -hmm. me of Florida, some places in the South, we're not allowed to talk about slavery. We're not allowed to talk about things that, um, Teach, teachers are allowed to talk about things that um, might make their students feel bad. Right, which is, of course, I mean, you know, the the preposterous, you know, I don't have to tell you guys, right, that the issue is that it might make white kids feel bad because yeah. not talking about it is making African-American mm -hmm. kids yeah. feel bad, okay, really. yeah. right? Yeah. But they, they seem not to, right, they yeah. seem not to count, that they're not. So it's just... 
it's you know i mean you're historians right like it's incredibly frustrating <laughs> because if you just sort of get it all yeah. out there yeah. okay so you talk about you said slavery for you is would be the, the kind of the binder um mm -hmm. and the and the, the 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 mayonnaise of the south um <laughs> Uh, I think I was imagining, right. but it, that's yeah, okay. The mustard and the mayonnaise, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's fine for me because I, I really dislike mayonnaise, so I'm comfortable yeah. disliking both slavery and mayonnaise. Yeah. Just don't um, bring Escago into the conversation, yeah. Andrew. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. Um, just that. Um, what about the institutional institutionalization of white supremacy? That's trickier because, of course, white supremacy is present in the Civil War North, yeah. and there are, you know, laws against African Americans voting in the Civil War North, right? I mean, part of the issue that forces the 15th Amendment is that Northern states are not willing to change their voting laws. Yeah. So it's more complicated than just white supremacy. And I think, too, I mean, one thing I did, you know, having grown up in, in New York, um, is the distinction, right, between uh, de facto segregation, de jure segregation, and, and um, mm. the, the degree to which the school districts in my county, it was, had to be desegregated also, right? Even mm. though there were never black schools and white schools, you have neighborhood schools, which are, are you know, de facto segregated. Um, and so the the town that I lived in, uh, that I grew up in, lived in when I was little, I'm the, my parents' younger child, my parents were involved in the desegregation of that school district, which involved, right, in going from neighborhood schools to there was like a K-1-2 school and then a 3-4-5 school, right, to try to to balance that. And, and isn't it true? I think now the New York City school system is like one of the most segregated, if not the mm -hmm. most segregated in the country. So really, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because bad. it's <clears throat> residential segregation and and white, uh, you know, white wealthy white families sending their children to private school, and so. Of course, you know, if you listen to conservative <laughs> speakers, it's like, oh no, no, it's not white flight. It's right. They, they, it's they've choice. been yeah, it's a choice, and they got discriminated against because now they had to go to school with people they didn't want to go to school with, and all of it. <laughs> right, but yeah, you know, and the, the biggest. Thing. Uh, you know, the Boston busing crisis in the early 70s, again, right? That's not mm -hmm. de jure segregation, that was de facto. So it, it, that's why I feel like it's it's easy to say the South is the problem child of the United States mm -hmm. because they're racist, but we're not racist. Yeah. When in fact, mm, yeah, the, the North was the pretty whole bad. Is yeah. Reminds me of the the uh the trolls on on twitter the neo-confederate trolls on twitter will uh the cosplayers will throw up a a meme with some racist quote by sherman so yeah the northerners were racist too 100 so, percent. yeah <laughs> you so. know i mean i i i wrote a book about sherman and i think which, there were a lot of things which i have read by the way and i didn't realize it, it was you yeah, it's me. <laughs> uh, but but you know it's it's easy for me to to uh kind of like civil war sherman i i you know in the civil war section of sherman's memoirs are, are so eloquent but then i have to remember right that then sherman goes out west and is yeah. i mean even civil war era sherman was horribly racist yeah. uh, but the, you know he's not actually an admirable figure he's good at at one th he's good at war but he's not a, you know, a, a great guy, right? And the 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 genocides perpetrated against Native Americans and and you know nobody's hands are clean in the past. Yeah. No, it, it's funny was where he says that and uh, like I'm still waiting for LSU to name a building after Sherman. I, I hope that will happen in maybe my son's lifetime. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of don't name things after people because nobody's perfect. You know, everyone has. No, fears. but, you know, I, I, I just love the, like the, the squirming that people in Louisiana have every time Sherman comes up and they are reminded like, yes, he was the superintendent of your main flagship school. He loved the South. Yeah. He loved white Southerners. So it's, you know, all the more complicated, right? Nobody yeah. is, is but simple. It, he just, and he always maintained, right? You know, yeah. you can stop this anytime you want. Yeah. Well, it, but it reminded me of a, after Charlottesville, I, I did a little thing with Trey Welburn and Mark mm -hmm. Smith where we, we three of us got together on campus and did a little thing of like, let's talk about these Confederate monuments and Confederate <laughs> history and everything. And, mm -hmm. um, Always reminds me of John Oliver. We had sort of the uh, Confederate Santa Claus in the audience, but there was this one African American community activist, and he raised a very interesting question that he said, like, you know, I live on Jefferson C. Davis Street, and, you know, I don't think that's a good name either. And it took us a moment to be like, Jefferson C. Davis, oh, that guy right and like that totally spoke to that racism of like here's a u.s general right. for whom a street is named in macon georgia but who of course has all kinds of racist problems during sherman's march right right yeah i mean i don't think living on sherman avenue you know if i were native american would feel too good no. i mean it's, it's, that's why yeah innocuous names you know trees flowers yeah that, that works um all right since andrew asked about white supremacy i'm going to do my advisor fine and be like okay grady mcweeney cracker culture how do you feel about ethnic aspects was sort of like southerners sort of having that celtic background and that makes them distinct i didn't know you were a grady mcweeney student oh, that's no dan dan was dan Sutherland uh, was dan Sutherland and was. of course uh, everyone who graduated from dan's group had to read grady mcweeney's cracker culture i mean look <laughs> i think that the calling you know gettysburg one of the great celtic battles is maybe a step too far i do think there's a, a white, there's a white uh, you know a kind of poor uh, a scots irish white uh poor white culture but i would argue that again right they're not so outside the um larger milieu of the mm -hmm. south that you know with the exception of certain areas right sure you have eastern tennessee which is very unionist you have mm -hmm. you know pockets right? i mean the free state of jones <laughs> but but in large part, white poor whites go along with mm -hmm. and do not resist secession and war because, again, white supremacy is beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. the The old line, what did we call it? Heron Volk democracy uh, that we called it. In, I'm sure I've massacred the German, but but that well, we called it pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, is is in fact the um, it's true, right? Mm -hmm. it, and it is. I mean, it is. I think the story of American history is going all the way back to Jamestown, right? Mm -hmm. If you unite whites, regardless of class, that protects the ruling class because otherwise you're either going to have racial lines or class lines and the the white ruling class is safer frankly with with a racial distinction than a class distinction that of course then the strike of 1877 hits mm -hmm. <laughs> and that complicated right. but but you know one of the yeah. big reasons i think that that you don't have and the sort of European model of, of social Democrats and, and just mm -hmm. in general, like why isn't there socialism in American history as much socialism in American history is the use of race and ethnicity to constantly be dividing mm -hmm. the working class. Yeah. Well, then again, the use of socialism there um, is, you know, of course, in and of itself problematic because what you're talking about exactly is social democracy. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, socialism. the fact that, 
that the white working class, you know, the fact that Trump is so beloved by most of the white working class today when he wouldn't, you know, spit on them if they were, if were on fire to me is inexplicable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I can explain it, but but it it makes you, you no chose a, a more elegant um, analogy than, than than I would have chosen. But. <laughs> it's just it's it's mm -hmm. it's this you know that's the great sort of tragedy of Southern history too is right you know the the populist mm -hmm. movement and this brief moment where you could have had at least some right. you know mm -hmm. fragile but but class unity. Um, and right. then when that's broken, it's broken and yeah. you don't really see it again, even really until the, the thirties. And even then it's, mm -hmm. it's fragile. Yeah. Race is powerful in that. That's yeah, uh, it really <clears throat> is. Uh, so uh, can, I, I don't know. Um, can we, uh, I, I had a question. So you talk about ethnicity meals and then. I have not read uh, Cracker Culture. Um, Don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm. I'm. Re I was reading the synopsis uh, on my other screen. Um, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I, I did enjoy about your your book as well, just to come back to this, is the um, kind of the ideological origins of of all this with the the North and South the cavalier the round heads mm -hmm. um, you, you also talk about levelers you talk about the english revolution or the you talk about the english civil war you talk about the glorious revolution you talk about all sorts of um key moments in um i guess relatively recent anglo-saxon anglo-saxon history recent recent yeah well relatively speaking um yeah that, could could you talk a little bit about um the english where, origins yeah well the or where where did you um get that <laughs> where, 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 where did you encounter this stuff the, the that type of thing first where um how yeah. did you go about researching it did it did it come did it kind of, kind of come uh, organically or did you did you hunt for it i definitely don't recall hunting for it i mean if, if i had to say anything it came from and i can't believe i'm blanking on who wrote the book the book Cavalier oh. and Yankee, which who who oh. wrote that? You guys can look that up. Um, I'm like looking at my bookcase, but of course, all my most of my books are in my work office. Um, a lot of it, I was really influenced. Also, I will say in in and again, William right? Taylor. William Taylor, yes, Cavalier and Yankee, really interest influenced by Bertram Wyatt Brown mm -hmm. and um, Southern Honor, uh, which I thought was you know, was really powerful. And also, I mean, my own advisor, Ed Ayers, had written Vengeance and Justice, his first book, which really meshed well with um, with Wyatt Brown and Southern Honor. I mean, a lot of what I was writing against at the time was actually the um, Why the South Lost, which Greta McWinnie was one of the authors of that, wasn't he? Yeah, the and then the it was. I keep turning because I'm looking at my yeah, book. Case. I, I've got it somewhere. Um, yeah, it's a big it's, book. It's like, yeah. Um, yeah, they did How the North Won and then Why the South Lost. Yeah, why uh, the which was, yeah, yeah, I had a lot of problems with Davis that. Davis was in that group, and right, and they were yeah. arguing that part of the reason the South lost again, this this sort of you know, soft nationalism was like people felt guilty over slavery, and I was like, mm, no, they really yeah. didn't. No, there was no latent guilt over slavery that let people sort of not fight as hard for it. Um, so that's kind of where all of that came from. I didn't do any real deep research into that. That that would have been primarily out of secondary sources and then maybe mm -hmm. just looking at the, the language that they were using. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's the key often with those things, right? Like what's what's a language? How do they like connect themselves to other nationalist movement what kind of right. inspirations do they use and like i that, that was duncan's section in in our book on like the mm -hmm. kind of lincoln cromwell like english civil war american civil war comparison that like, yeah and i did it, much more with the the degree to which the confederacy drew on the american revolution mm -hmm. 
really grabbed hold of all of that iconography and Washington and Jefferson and, and um, all of that as this bid for, I argue bid for legitimacy, right? They're, Mm -hmm. they're taking in the revolutionary war, a usable past. Mm -hmm. uh, And they very carefully allied, you know, the fact that like, oh, there was actually a revolution in the North and like, like there's no John Adams in, in their version, Mm -hmm. right? It's all Washington Washington. and Nathaniel Green. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's that um, where they're very self-consciously using that. Um, I haven't read it yet. It, it just came out. Michael Haddam's new book on on seventeen seventy six. Oh, yeah, I just oh, saw. Yeah, that. yeah. It yeah just that came out. I mean, it, uh, I've I've been well, there's a, there's a book we can do. Yeah, I, I've been looking forward to it for for years now because uh, you know he, he's he's talked about it, but uh, it got me to thinking about the Fourth of July, and um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you uh, historians at the movies, Jason Herb. Jason yeah, Herb, I know Herb, it. Yeah. yeah. The podcast that he does, uh, they talked about Gettysburg. The episode this week talked about the movie Gettysburg. Um, and uh, one of the things that you've seen it, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the things that uh, kind of struck me in uh, thinking about it yesterday as I was driving home from work. I'm on on, va- I'm on vacation, by the way, officially now. <laughs> um, summer vacation. So uh, driving home from work yesterday. It was the 5th of July. And I was thinking about the fourth and in the movie Gettysburg, uh, they, on the third, one of them mentions, oh, it's almost the 4th of July. Oh, I've forgotten about it because, so um, in your book, you talk about them uh, revering, uh, obviously, the, the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence. Um, and then you talk about after the war, the 4th of July being the, the celebration for African-Americans and not for the white South. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So Confederate Memorial Day becomes the becomes the the the, the, right. the, the celebration. Um, did they? Uh, this is an actual question. Did um, was July Fourth a holiday in the Confederacy, or was it part of the national? Did it remain part of the national? I guess calendar. I think it was, but it also. Um, the bigger holiday in the 19th, in the 19th century, I think even bigger than July 4th was Washington's birthday. They love, in the Confederacy loved Washington's birthday. So they did, uh, Davis's inauguration was on Washington's birthday, things like that. So yeah, I think they, they did celebrate it. Um, but not as much. I might be wrong about that. It's honestly, but, like, but they wouldn't have forgotten about it like it was portrayed in the in the movie Gettysburg. Well, I think you forget about it because you're in the middle of this huge battle, and so you just don't think about what day it is. Yeah, they're they're sleep deprived. Right, they're like <laughs> huh. you know, I don't know what day it is more well, than I. They're, think they're sleeping up late, drinking, drinking and playing cards too. So, <laughs> yeah, but I guess right, the degree to which the Fourth of July is is also about celebrating the flag and things like that mm. but no mm. i think they still celebrated fourth of july yeah. Um, yeah i think i remember there was somewhat concerns of like ooh, vicksburg surrenders on the force can we do it like a day it, later or earlier right. right well and then there's that whole me not meme, but you know kind of myth that well they never celebrated the fourth of july again in vicksburg or like it took them till the 70s i mean black people still celebrated it people still yeah. celebrate yeah. yeah of course right um uh but that, that's sort of like the, and I, I know in like, there's so much diplomatic correspondence of like these guys in everywhere writing in of like, we had this 4th of July party at our, our building and like all these people came or like there was like a parade in front of the yeah. building. <laughs> You're kind of well, like. Well, and I mean, they still do, right? Overseas. Yeah. I think the embassy has a big 4th of July party. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yep. It's like. Does um does Haddon's book? Do you know? Does he go up through the bicentennial? I don't know. Ooh, I don't yeah. know. Um, and I'm really looking forward to to reading it uh, because I, you know the, his first book was fantastic. And I'm showing my age because of course I actually remember the bicentennial. I was a little kid then, so I remember the um, uh, going to New York City and and going to somebody's apartment and watching the tall ships. Little, 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 oh little, yes, little, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I was born two years later. Yeah. 
I taught I teach that in my or taught that in my survey courses. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, there was like a big like oh it was like the whole bicentennial was just a mess because yeah, the of like no because it was like there was like this desire for like all these kind of commemorations and like it, yeah messy messy stuff no it would be interesting all right it's on the list now andrew <laughs> will do him at at some point fantastic yes yes uh, uh you also have like since I forget where was this starting. <laughs> where this thing started. Um, women. That was another one that yeah. you kind of really strongly emphasized in your book as sort of like, like race were already had, like religion was a right. big one, but like the, the role of women, like, I mean, that's, that's always a key part, right? Of like, when we, when we sing 19th century, like, yes, they can vote, but there's other ways how women can kind of. Right foster right. national identity and political identity yeah and it's very much sort of a form of republican womanhood right this idea mm. of having confederate women and how they should be raising confederate children and the role of these you know the fact that there's these confederate textbooks are published and again to sort of train up um confederate children and then the ways that women are both um pushing confederate nationalism and mm -hmm. and and forcing confederate nationalism i don't i love drew faust's book um mothers of invention except mm -hmm. for and i taught it for years and I, I do really love it um i don't love and i've always really pushed hard against her conclusion that it was women withdrawing their support from the confederacy that doomed the confederacy because that again gets into my idea of these conflicting loyalty mm -hmm. um and uh, I do think, you know, my book really focused a lot more on elite women. And I think um, Stephanie McCurry, for example, which again, I don't necessarily agree with all the conclusions in her book, but I think she did a great job bringing working class women into the story of, mm -hmm. of nationalism and the importance um of their resistance. But again, this idea also that it's women who have to bear up a lot of these sacrifices, mm -hmm. that it's the women at home who are really struggling to keep the, the nation going and the degree to which they're suffering is putting pressure on the Confederacy. The book that I'm working on right now, actually, I'm looking at um, uh, hunger and food shortages and starvation mm. in the South during the Civil War. And a tiny bit of it actually grew out of um, some of the work I had done for my dissertation and actually took out for the book. Um, so looking at, but what I've found is that, that I'm looking much more, I'm much more interested in questions of poor relief and who, um, how are, uh, you know, even just local people trying to support these soldiers' wives because soldiers' wives are becoming actually a real political constituency. Man. And they had the the I tried a very fine line um between uh support and overstepping. Yeah. They overstepped and they were entering the realm of manliness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and just the degree to which women also are, are careful to um, portray themselves, right? When women are, mm -hmm. are writing to governors for food or even going to sort of local grandees for food, they're, they're very careful always to portray mm -hmm. themselves as wives and mothers mm -hmm. of soldiers and therefore worthy, worthy of support. This is white women that I'm talking about. Of before. course. Well, yeah. Uh, and that's the challenge, right? Of like that like you you are a poor working, poor wife of a farmer, and you have to do all the hard work. You don't have slaves that can do the work. You can barely right. sustain your family, right? And then you, of course, you have the plantation mistress who has an overseer and twenty slaves or thirty slaves that can like do all everything. And it's like there is a big divide between these two kind of like. And then you have the bread riots, right? And and it's like right. all of and a sudden the bread the riots are are all over. They're not yeah. just 
Richmond right. and, you know, Salisbury and Atlanta. I mean, they're happening all over on a much smaller scale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, I, you know, part of what had brought me into this, this project that I'm working on now is you have all this, these elite women complaining about, oh, we have nothing to eat and blah, 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 or we're eating this and that. And what it really means is they don't have the food of the elite. They don't have white flour. They don't have white sugar. Mm-hmm. So they're eating cornmeal, they're eating molasses. And what that then sparked the question, which is like, well, if they're eating the food of the poor, mm. what are the poor eating? Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right. And yeah. the answer is not a lot. Yeah. Um, and often being supported by, you know, state grants of food, but then also often, right, having you know, if you're a, a poor farmer, or even if you're a plantation living on a white plantation, right, it doesn't really matter to you which army comes through. Every army is going to take your food. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's getting it's into that. Indiscriminate like, in that. Right. It reminds me of medieval Europe, actually. Yeah. In many ways. No, I mean, um, one, of the, one of the most interesting classes I had when I was an undergrad was um, on... 17th century France mm-hmm. and uh, you know um, there were a lot of wars at that time well wars aside uh, poverty was mm. so endemic and yeah. people I mean, it wasn't even subsistence farming it was literally not having anything to eat I mean mm-hmm. you could be a subsistence farmer and still owe your your dues, your your mm-hmm. your dues to your to your lord or whatever. But when it came down to it, what did you actually ingest? Yeah. So what did you make your bread from? Mm-hmm. And this uh, our, this professor Kevin Robbins, he he gave us examples of people in in some parts of actually using bark of trees at, for part of their flour. And I don't know how 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 widespread that type of thing was but if you're talking about um people in white people in the south complaining about or and complaining about not having the food that they're seeing their uh their elite neighbors having so white right. flour um you know the food of the rich food of the you know refined stuff you know um sugar white sugar um i, I don't know what else real coffee maybe mm. um yeah wine I, I don't know what what yeah. else um and you're seeing yourself you know having to have you know of course cornmeal you're having um you're having to do something with the chaff of, of from, from the wheat um you're not having uh you have to deal with chicory um yeah, yeah. Well, what people below you eating exactly yeah it's, it's, it's exactly that and and of course also the the issue is what are enslaved people being mm-hmm. fed and then what happens um, when enslaved people go to the Union Army and wind up in in refugee camps, and the Union wants to has to feed them, but the Union doesn't want to feed them, and so it's a it's a it's a pretty complicated story. So, are, are you looking at the Freedmen's Bureau as well? And yeah, I'm going up through the famine of 1867 where there you have the Freedmen's Bureau and you also have a bunch of, of Northern relief organizations that are feeding white Southerners. Yeah, that was okay. 66 and 67. Because I, I think you in your book, you do talk about um, white relief from... Yeah. Uh, from uh, uh, unhappy white people receiving aid from the Freedmen's Bureau. Right, yes, uh, yes, yes. And then I found, it, again, in doing research for this book now, that... Um, also, there are cases where the Freedmen's Bureau are, and the case that I found is from Mississippi. It still may be the army doing it, but they're actually giving more food to white families than they are to black families mm. in 1865, like May and June of 1865. Yeah, it's all it's all entangled. So do you have an explanation for that? Were there more white people than black people? Oh, no, no. They're giving them different sets of rations. Oh, So black families are getting corn and peas and white families are getting corn and peas and sugar and rye coffee. Oh, yeah. 
Very food, racist. Food segregation. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's really striking. And and white women are noted in the records by name as Mrs. So and so, and black women are just a a black woman with ex children. Really interesting. Wow. Yeah. Talk about violence. Yeah. That well, no, goes back really... to our earlier point, right? Northerners were just as racist as Absolutely. Southerners were. Absolutely. Yeah. Like... You know, it's it's yeah. What, what were they? What were they? Northerners or Southerners who were administering? Northerners, uh, Union Union officers, Union soldiers. So they weren't. They weren't um, Southern Unionists. No, not in the the records that I'm talking about. No, okay. this is in Jackson, right after Jackson, Mississippi, right as the war ends. Okay. Um, yeah, it was a set of receipts, basically, that I was looking at. Okay. Crazy. Yep, and yet <laughs> crazy, and yet not right. all that. Not surreal. really. Right. Yeah, it, it, believable. It makes right. Sense. Yeah, I think that's it. Well, unfortunately. Believable. Yeah. Oh, I now I remember it. I, I was going to ask when you were talking about the about women, right? Mm-hmm. Elite women, and like it, it's sort of interesting when you think of like that 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 challenge, regardless of who you were, rich or poor. You struggled during the war years. You questioned the nation eventually. You questioned the state eventually. You kind of you were losing your commitment, right? Mm-hmm. And that's sort of the beauty when you take it into reconstruction and that generation that's born, grows up, matures during reconstruction, say it's the KKK's liberation, quote unquote, of the South. And that's of course then the kernel around which the UDC gets constructed. That thing takes this whole romantic <laughs> new form of Confederate nationalism. And it, it, it's sort of, it's almost a rewriting of their history in that moment. Like they forgot of yeah. all the hardships. Absolutely. The UDC, they completely forget all the hardships or they reframe the hardships as sort of a triumph over hardship. Um, and I do think it's fascinating the power that the UDC has and, and the degree to which the UDC becomes the keeper of the flames rather than the sons mm-hmm. of Confederate veterans. Okay. They're just not as as big of an organization, and I don't, I don't know that that anyone's actually figured out why that is. That people look very closely at the, you know, Karen Cox's work, for example, on the UDC, but there's the the sons are just not, they're just not as powerful as the daughters become, and the daughters are so powerful. Mm-hmm. I mean, the daughters are the ones who are raising money and erecting all those monuments everywhere. Right. Mm-hmm coming from the daughters I, I seem to remember somewhere reading of like it's it was sort of not something man engaged in right like oh right. It's not, but it, it is funny when you when you think of like that that dynamic yeah. and today it's the exact opposite right like the udc is hardly ever in the news and this it's a sense of confederate veterans who always I up think in the arms UDC about everything just kind of keeps itself quiet yeah you know? Or, otherwise they lose tax exempt status like they did right they virginia. lost it didn't they just now yeah, in virginia yeah um yes yes that museum of theirs right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. right next to the um the, mm-hmm. the virginia museum of history and culture okay. and the um art museum and yeah. actually right if you've ever i don't know if you've been to richmond lately but there's a giant um kahinde wiley statue called rumors of war that's installed on the grounds of the Virginia Art Museum, right facing battle at facing the UDC headquarters. That is, you know, this sort of incredible rebuke to mm-hmm. the Monument Avenue statues. It's really interesting. Yeah. It's been 30 years since I've been there. <laughs> it's changed a lot. I've... I mean, the monuments are gone. For the better. Yeah. <laughs> Change yeah. for the better. There we go. Yeah, yeah. No, it's wild. It's crazy. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I really um, enjoyed, well, one of the themes that I enjoyed um, in the kind of the, the course of the of, of the book from say the beginning and like the 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 birth of the Confederate identity um, through the war as the war began to to 
as things began to go against the Confederacy, mm-hmm. but it, it went from the theme it started with, with optimism and it went on through hope. And then little by little, the hope turned to doubt. Yep. And then the doubt turned to collapse with the defeat. Mm-hmm. And then the defeat brought it into the lost cause. Um, but the the idea, the the hope that 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 the that especially the women um, maintained for their new nation was incredible. And I found it I found it amazing how how strong that hope was all the way through the book. Yeah, and I, yes, I mean I tried to be empathetic to people and and right the degree to which they're hoping that this is going to work and that this is going to happen i do wonder like hearing you talk about it now and and maybe i'm you know 25 30 years more cynical than i i was (laughs) then is also right the degree to which people write down hope and they maybe don't always write down despair. I, I don't know. Yeah, despair mm. is the word I was looking for. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, there are the, or, that people don't seem to, you certainly, there's a culture of, of no public expression of despair, right? Mm-hmm. Everything is always super rosy and, and, you know, victory is always just around the corner. Um, And so there's a degree to which that that seems hardly possible. And people do write about despair. I mean, but I think it's the natural, I I don't know, maybe it's also people's natural inclination to be hopeful. Um, They do to to hope beyond, I think, a real rational Yeah, I mean, especially it was really striking when you're talking about, you know, as rumors of things began to yeah. began to encroach, you know, the, the the even the little 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 towns across the south, um, lines of communication were pretty well cut, but the rumor mill was 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 going full, yeah, uh, full steam. Um, th- there was still there was doubt, but the hope was kind of still there, pushing its way through. Um, maybe it was self delusion. I think there's a ton of yeah. self delusion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of self delusion in the South in general, right? There's this self delusion that enslaved people love white people yeah. mm-hmm. and would never hurt them or leave them. And 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 so, so much of the bitterness and anger that you see right after the war is the realization that, oh, actually enslaved people are going, you know, formerly enslaved mm-hmm. people don't want to be in this subservient position. Um, I think- a shocker. Right. No, go figure. I think too, maybe there's a kind of like the sunk cost fallacy at play in the Confederacy too, which is they've given up so much and they've made so many sacrifices. And so you don't want to believe mm-hmm. that, that it was yeah. wrong all along. Yeah. Um, you know, I think well, there's and, that. Well, and then what they've given up I mean, because so many have lost all their sons. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. I mean, just the the human sacrifices of the war are incredible. And and that's the other thing, you know, one of the things I always say to my students is when the war is beginning and is that that, uh, you know, nobody knew what it was going to cost. Nobody went into war expecting 750,000 people were going to die. They might have made some different decisions then. But it's just the numbers are so unfathomable and the scale of of devastation is so unfathomable. That would be interesting. That would be an interesting counterfactual. Right. <laughs> yeah. We can't. Thankfully, we can't do that one. Uh, I have a. I have a question about the architecture. Lot? What structure of your book? Mm-hmm. Niels, do you have something? Did you want to chime in with this last? You could you do do your last questions and I do my last question. How about that? <laughs> well, okay. Um, yeah, yours so, is architecture. Um, well, one thing that 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 I that I enjoyed um, as well, and this is a tr- question about structure. And you know, I'm working on my 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 PhD thesis. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, others speak, and 
I really enjoyed the interludes. Yeah. Um, and it was a different, mm. it was a different structure that I'm that I'm used to to, to seeing, um, because you get the you have your the meat of your chapters, but then you also have these really important little nuggets that you're able to uh, dig into mm -hmm. for you know five or six pages, mm -hmm. um, that help understand the, the the bigger context, and without which the book would be lacking something. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with the idea of the interludes as opposed to incorporating those different ideas into the chapters? Yeah. Sorry about the question. No, it's a great question. I'm trying to think back to 1999. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I mean, <laughs> no, it's okay. So the the biggest like it was thing yesterday, right? <laughs> changed from the dissertation was the dissertation was really chrono the, especially the war chapters were really chronological and had this kind of ebb and flow of like responding to events and it made it a little tedious. Um, and so I think what I did with the interludes was used them. I really wish I could remember exactly why I did it. Um, I think I used them a little bit also because I was like, I don't really know where this fits. Like the one that I remember the best is the one where the, they talk about the guy having the the vision of the white bales of cotton kind of marching. Um, but I think that's sort of what I tried to do was stuff that didn't quite fit anywhere else, but that was almost too good to, to let go of. Mm -hmm. I put it in those um, and it did work. It did, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I, I, I did like that. And I sort of like books that are like that, you know, um, Amy Taylor's book about um, the contraband camps and battled mm -hmm. refuge. She also has a lot of those kind of stories interspersed. Um, and I know the the hunger book that I'm writing right now. I am thinking about a set of chapters that are um, kind of spatially oriented, and then shorter chapters that are about different kinds of foods so like a chapter on coffee a chapter on... so Ooh. but so in but other I... words they're going to be palate cleansers yeah exactly <laughs> snacks <laughs> right i know i thought i was like oh i could make a menu but that's like a little too cutesy um you know i think though i i will say that if you're thinking about that when you're writing a dissertation sometimes a dissertation you just want to get it written yes <laughs> so get it done <laughs> And structure is hard. Uh, right. You know, I I, um, I know for myself writing this hunger book, I've really struggled a lot with the structure um, in a way that like this book, I feel like the structure was pretty straightforward. And certainly my Sherman book, the structure mm -hmm. kind of revealed itself to me very easily. Um, so I don't know how helpful that is. But I mean, you answered the question. I, I just wanted to to kind of highlight the fact that the interludes were were. Yeah. Um, uh, it was interesting. It's an interesting way of doing it. And um, did, did, was there any pushback from uh, UNC Press? I don't think so. Actually, no. Not that I recall. Usually, it's I, the reviewers that push freedom. back and are like, "That doesn't work." Yeah. No. <laughs> I think I think the press was really pretty open to it. Hmm. Um. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes also copy editors, you know, that are like, no, we don't do that. And like that. No, they were great. I, you know, I, I had a great, you know, and UNC Press does a lot of um, first books. Um, but I had a really, I've had a great experience with that press. You know, both, both of my um, main books have been with them. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm done with my question. Okay. <laughs> oh, I get the final word. Uh, so I was actually curious because um, obviously it's been 20 years. Um, we already touched on like the, the guys you wrote against sort of in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s. So what, what do you, how do you feel about the last 20, 20 years and reg scholarship regarding sort of the confederacy as a nation kind yeah. of na confederate nationalism so is is was there any book where you were like man i wish i had said that or 
why do we rehash this old debate again? W were there any kind of moments where you're like, "Ooh, this this is good. This is great new, great new I mean, ideas," think, or? I think there's been a lot. I think the fact that 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 in the last twenty years people aren't debating the sort of strength of Confederate nationalism. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been a lot of more exploration of the kind of culture of Confederate nationalism in mm -hmm. Bennington's book and uh, Mike Burnath's book. Um, I think the the real freshest work has been the internationalization of it. So a little bit of Don Doyle's work and then um, Ann Tucker's book, The Newest Born of Nations. Um, and also, oh, I'm trying to think, I just read it for something. But the, the idea, you know, Americans tend to be very... <laughs> Oh, yes, that book is fabulous. <laughs> um, but Americans tend to be very, uh, you know, we, we think we're exceptional, right? American exceptionalism Ooh. is always at play. And I think the degree to which people are now doing transnational work and saying, oh, well, you know, the, the war is happening no longer. The war was not happening in a vacuum. This nationalism is not happening in a vacuum, right? It's happening all over at the same time. And ah, I just read a book maybe last year that uh, looked last at- Last year. Wow, it looks at the United States, it looks at the Civil War and it, and it looks at, um, I wanna say like Argentina, Oh, Evan Rosera's book on... Yes. Yeah. I really like that book. Evan Rosera's book. Yes. I can't think of the title either. But... Uh, Reconstructions... Like I, I, Whatever. I know the yeah. book. Yeah. We're thinking of the same book. So I yeah. really like that. I like Dan Tucker. So I think that's the, the most sort of profitable or most interesting uh, direction to go in with it. Yeah. And just for the record, I did not pay or encourage or send a any email to kind of encourage her to say that. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. I just want to be clear that since I'm working on that subject, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not no, pushing no. that on, on anybody here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think but that's yeah. where it is. Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, it's, I mean, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, that that ties in with, with you, with, with Niels and I both. I mean, um, we both have this you know, transnational experience for right. the Civil War anyway. Man, yeah, they, I think they... it's valuable. I mean, I think Americans are, are we think everything is exceptional. Okay. Well, yeah, and the, the, these guys did not live in a box, right? It's like they, yeah. they knew things that were going on and they kind of, they right. read these, they read these nationalists and. And the, um, the comparative is also valuable just to say like, oh, well, what is a sort of uniquely American and what is in fact maybe right. just inherent to a civil war, inherent to rebuilding yeah. after civil war. Well, yeah. Right. Um, oh. <laughs> or as a nation that continues after the state falls. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. A lot of living in Austria, that's what a lot of Austrian Habsburg lands suffered under like, oh, we perceive ourselves as Czech, but we're under this Austrian ruler. Yeah. Wouldn't and it'd be nice. You know, I started writing the book uh right around the time that you had um like uh, oh yeah, that's Yugoslavia. In Rwanda in Central yeah. Africa, the Balkans, like it didn't yeah. sort of matter. You know, I just would sort of update if I gave a talk, like update the new. A new nationalist anecdote for the time um, that it does still seem to be, you know, it's a sort of perennial issue, this idea that these national identities are constructed and reconstructed and, and what endures and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm going to give you the one last chance, Andrew. Well, I mean, and then uh, for me, the, you're talking about enduring and going through Ending in 1868, um, I think is a is a great. It, it's not arbitrary, um, and it, it's a it's a great opening to. Mm -hmm. It's a great door, a gateway um, to allow the to 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 see where Confederate national national identity is going to go, mm -hmm. as opposed to being you know the door being closed, slammed shut with with uh, Lee's surrender or with Jefferson's capture, with Jefferson Davis's capture or any number of little right. independent anecdotal endings. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. When it didn't end, right? That's the thing. It did not end with 
Lee surrendering did not mean anything for the Confederate like, no. mind frame. No, and I think the degree to which um, recent, you know, the last 20 years of scholarship on violence during Reconstruction mm -hmm. really shows that um, that it didn't end. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we are at well over close yes. to an hour and a half at this stage so we should close for for today um again and so so much thanks for coming out and indulging us here almost 20 years that a shattered nation is now around and um still a like still a big topic the ideas issues with regard to um confederate nation nationalism well, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And hopefully I will uh, see you guys again sometime. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was, it was really nice talking to you. Um, it was it was a great it was a great book. Holds up, holds up, stands withstands the test of time. And uh, yeah. Like yeah, not as easily torn down as a statue. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> Thank you.